Good morning, and welcome to another episode of Legislative Matters Now. I'm Morgan Spicer, Self-Advocate Coordinator with People First of West Virginia. Our program aims to educate all self-advocates, including myself, on the ever-important topic of legislative advocacy. Now, we do this by having a guest each month to talk about various pieces of legislation. We also, on many programs, depending on the topic and time allowed, do a segment called Advocate in Action, where we talk to a self-advocate who is using their self-advocacy skills in a positive light to not only influence their lives, but the lives of others around them. One note about this interview. Since this interview was recorded, Governor Justice called for a special session to restore the cuts. Let's go to the interview to find out how the cuts would impact thousands of people. And at the end, I'll tell you what happened. So thank you so much for joining me this morning. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. So Trina, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I am Trina Clark. Uh, I am a, a dedicated parent to three wonderful children. Um, my oldest is Clark, and he's 23. He did four years in active duty Air Force, and now he's going to college. And I have Aiden, who is 16, and Lucy May is 13. And both of them have an unspecified genetic disorder, which causes them to have both physical and mental impairments. Um, I work as a service coordinator with our West Virginia Birth to Three program and employee service coordinators for that program across the state as well. And I've also been uh, serving in our West Virginia Air National Guard for about 20 years now. Um, but as a parent, I've just learned to navigate really the complexities of advocating for my children, um, their needs, and ensuring that they have access to the support and services that they require to be able to thrive. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Thank you. I've enjoyed it. And you know, we have our birth to three chapter here in Parkersburg where our ARC offices are. So we mm -hmm. get a lot of them and we talk a lot to some of the members of birth to three. So awesome. It's a great program. My children it, went through it and that's what really got me um, passionate about the program and being a part of it. Yeah. I had a friend, um, his son utilized birth to three and they absolutely loved it and really appreciated the services they got out of it. Absolutely. It's amazing. So why is self-advocacy so important to you? Well, self-advocacy looks a little different um, for our family since Aiden and Lucy May do require full care and they don't have a voice of their own. Um, so I've pretty much become their advocate, um, you know, advocating for their rights and needs and not only ensuring that they receive the necessary support, but also looking out for the needs and support of others. Um, I feel like the, the things that I do, the work that I do on a daily basis um, really isn't only just about my own children, but it's just ensuring that there is somebody that has a voice out there for everyone um, who needs some, some self-advocation. Okay. Yeah. And I definitely agree. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, self-advocacy is just something that, we do every day. I mean, the av just to decide to get up in the morning and go to work, that's advocacy. Because you're true. choosing to do something with your life and you're choosing a better option to get out there and apply yourself in your community and make a difference. Absolutely. So you were one of the speakers at the Don't Cut Our Lifeline rally held in Charleston uh, at the beginning of April. Can you explain how that would impact your life and your children and how important this program is? Yeah, um, you know, during during my speech there, I mentioned that this isn't the first time that I've had to get up and talk or that the group um, has had to get up and really advocate for all the individuals that would be impacted by the cuts that our legislators are, are proposing or, or even voted on, not just proposing. Um, and so when I think about what that looks like for my family alone, um, you know, we've, we've had waiver for, for Aiden going on 14 years now. And over the years, it has just been cut more and cut more and cut more. And I've seen the difference. Um, and I'll be honest with you, when I, when I first started, um, receiving waiver for Aiden, you know, me as a parent, I did receive payments. 
Um, and in that moment in my life, it was, it was what saved us. Um, had, I, I didn't have the ability to be able to work a full-time job because of all of his needs, his therapies, his medical care out of state. There was just so much that was going on in his little life at that time that Waver was truly a lifeline that saved saved our family. Um, and then, you know, as, as a couple of years went by, his, his medical status got better. Then I was able to really use some of the other benefits such as respite so that I could go to school and still have someone caring for him. And then go on to, you know, be able to work full time and be able to run a, a business of my own. And so Waver has not only provided, you know, supports to care for my children that I wouldn't be able to get to just a daycare um, so that I could better my life. So in the long run, I can make sure that I'm providing the best care, support and life for my children. But you know, Waver provides so many other services. Um, some of us use all of them. Some of us don't. But the big thing right now with these cuts, and I, I just envision what this would look like for every family that receives these services or every individual that receives these waiver services, is, you know, them not being able to get out into the community where they should be an active part uh, you know, in that community. Um, I see that medical care would not be happening because either they can't get to it or it's no longer being provided. Um, you know, those inclusion opportunities in the community, the the therapies that individuals who receive waiver desperately need. Um, you know, all these things are funded by the waiver program. And Cutting $44 million from this program, I mean, I cannot even imagine what then the Department of Health and Services would have to have to make cuts with this program to keep it even running. So as far as my specific family goes, um, you know, it, it it's going to cut out that additional assistance, which is going to make me not be able to work more. It's going to keep my children um, out of, out of those inclusive opportunities that we're able to do right now. So it, it would be devastating. Yes. It, it, very staggering. And, you know, this was my first year going to the waiver, uh, waiver rally. Mm -hmm. So I was just, you know, I, I believe I told um, a couple of the members that went with us, that I was just blown away by the amount of people in that room. There were so many people in that room that the support and, you know, the voice was so strong. Absolutely. So I think we definitely made an impact, you know, because they definitely heard us. And so we, you know, as self-advocates, we want to be make sure our voice is heard. Because it's very important that we get these cuts to not happen. Well, and I think it's sad that we are continuing to have to go and rally like that. You know, um, it's one thing to go down to the legislation on, on Disability Day and get to meet, you know, our legislators. Um, but then to have to turn around and come back and rally for the assistance that is necessary for for everyone. Um, it's just, I don't know, this is our most vulnerable population to think that they then have to drive from the Northern Panhandle, from the Eastern Panhandle to come down to the Capitol to have these rallies. I just, it's ridiculous to me. Yeah, that reminds me of something that um, Tracy said that we'll just keep coming until you do something about it. <laughs> right. And we have, it seems like every just couple of years, there we are again. Yeah. Yep. So you mentioned there that you own your own business. Mm -hmm. um could you do you what could you explain that for what what that is exactly yeah so um when i became a service coordinator with the west virginia birth to three program um you know i told you my, my children aiden and lucy may had been through that program and i just fell in love with it it became my passion and what i truly wanted to see statewide was quality service coordination um throughout the state 
And at that time, there wasn't a whole lot of oversight from the state level of the birth to three office because we are contracted through the state. Um, so, so that's what I did. I, I took over an agency when the owner of the agency that I worked for retired back in 2017. And I now employ 27 service coordinators across the state. So that's your, your company just, it helps train service coordinators? Yeah. So we train and employ service coordinators to then serve our families in birth to three. So typically we end up serving anywhere from two to 3,000 families a year. Awesome. That is, that's great. So that's like a program within a program. You're working for birth to three, but then you have this going on. So that's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And you know, it's one of those things from my experiences with my children throughout my life. Um, I, I ensure that the, the individuals that work for me as service coordinators, that they know about the waiver program to help families connect to that that are needed once the child is three um, as well as other resources. That's a big piece of what service coordination is, is, is helping those families learn how to advocate for themselves and connect themselves to resources and really just empower them to be able to find the information that they need once birth to three is, is over. Perfect. So what are some things that you've learned throughout your self-advocacy journey that you wish you that you wish you knew that can benefit others. Like if they didn't know it, what would you be able to teach them? Oh my goodness. There's so much out there. <laughs> um, but I'd say one of the most important lessons I've learned is the power of collaboration and community, um, building strong networks with other families, with advocacy groups, um, with policymakers, you know, all of that has been instrumental in navigating complexities of the system um, and truly learning to drive positive change. Um, uh, goodness, staying informed about rights and available resources has really empowered me to advocate more effectively for my children. And the more that you can go out and learn those things for yourself, um, that that's going to really kickstart where you need to be to help drive that positive change as well. Yeah, I'm always a firm believer of strength in numbers. Um, that's mm -hmm. what's amazing about self-advocacy is, is that you, especially with people first, because you have these group, you know, these group of individuals that are, you know, going through what you're going through and you, you, through them, you find your voice and you just ally yourself with them to help because you're not only helping them you're helping yourself and you're helping your community absolutely so that's why i love people first and why i'm so glad to be a part of it is because of that strength and numbers complex yes it becomes your village yes absolutely <laughs> so if you could give any advice to self-advocates when it comes to being effective in their self-advocacy what would you tell them Oh, the biggest advice to fellow self-advocates is just educate yourself, um, stay connected, be persistent, uh, take the time to learn about rights and available resources and services, and don't hesitate to reach out for support like we were just discussing. Um, you know, that's needed. If we, we don't always know everything. Um, but by coming together really as a united voice, you can amplify our impact and drive meaningful change for ourselves and future generations. Yeah. And that's, we, we, again, that's, you know, people first there is why I'm glad that we do that because we want to give them the voice. I mean, we're not speaking for them, mm -hmm. you know, but we're helping them to become effective advocates within their community to shape that change. Absolutely. To get those resources to go out there and have the courage to talk to your legislators. Cause it, yeah, it can get, it can get a little nerve wracking. I get that. It's definitely intimidating and, you know, trying to find the right people that will listen is, yeah. is not always the easiest thing to do on the first time. Yeah. Okay. Well, is there anything else you would like to add? 
I just want to express my gratitude to everyone who supported our advocacy efforts and stood alongside us to fight and protect crucial programs like our IDD waiver program. Um, together, I think we can really make a difference and ensure that all individuals with disabilities have the opportunities and support that they need to really truly live ful fulfilling lives. Um, and, and we're, like you said earlier, you know, you mentioned Tracy and that we'll just keep rallying and, and just know that, you know, even though it may seem frustrating, don't give up, you know, we, we've got to be out there and, and let our voices be heard and, and continue to, to do that self-advocation. Um, and just know you're not alone. You know, we have a whole group around us that, that are here to support everyone on a daily basis. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Trina, for taking the time to speak with us today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor. Thank you. Have a great one. As promised, let me tell you what happened during the special session held earlier this month. Governor Justice was partially successful. While the money was restored to the IDD waiver line item, the House wanted to require the money to be spent on the programs. The Senate took that safeguard out, then adjourned. The House didn't want to leave without putting the money back, so they did improve or concur with the Senate version. We could only hope the money is spent the way it should be. In addition, the House tried to increase the reimbursement rates for caregivers. That was also not approved during the special session. So while the money was restored, it isn't exactly what everyone at the rally wanted. I encourage you to keep an eye on what's happening because you may be called on again to write or call your lawmakers. Thank you so much, Trina, for joining us today. And don't forget, if you have an important piece of legislation you want discussed in a future episode or want to be an advocate in action, don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can call the ARC at 304-422-3151, extension 129, or you can email me directly. My email address is morgan.spicer at thearcmov.org. Now, one note is if I don't answer, please leave a message and I will get back to you as soon as I can. With that, we're out of time for this month's episode. Thanks so much, Trina, for speaking with, today, speaking with us today, and thank you for joining us. Remember, advocacy matters, and so do you. See you next time.